Good morning, everyone. It is 11.15 and we are going to start with a program uh, for today. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the annual session of the interest group uh, number 10, Biology of Aging Geriatrics of the National Academy of Medicine. My name is Walter Frontera and I'm the chair of the planning committee for this session. I would also like to recognize the other members of the planning committee, uh, Judy Salerno from the New York Academy of Medicine, Elisa Eppel from the University of California, San Francisco, and Mary Tinetti from Yale University. The main topic for today is ageism in the era of inclusion and diversity. And we have invited uh, two fantastic speakers to make a 20 minute presentation each. The presentations will be followed by a reaction um, by two experts in the area. Uh, we will also have an open discussion uh, with questions and answers after each uh, presentation and reaction. Now, before we proceed with the program, we would like to invite the president of the National Academy of Medicine to say a few words. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. And Judy, good morning to all of you. And for those who are actually joining us from maybe Europe, Japan, uh, Asia, say good evening and good afternoon. So um, I invited myself to you, but Walter is very nice to say, sure, come and speak to us, because this is such an important topic. Uh, I think you all know that this is the first grand challenge for uh, National Academy of Medicine, healthy aging. And of course, our second grand challenge, you'll hear some more at this meeting, is climate change. You can see that our members have chosen very judiciously about what are the big, big issues that face our society, what are the big issues that face, in fact, our nation, and of course, our population, and that's aging. But I think uh, what you guys can talk about is such an important issue because of the entire social and environmental impact on aging. What we've been thinking about a lot, of course, is how to enable the population which clearly is getting older, but healthier. How do you, in fact, enable a healthy longevity? I believe you would agree that overall lifespan is being achieved and extended lifespan uh, in almost everywhere in the world. However, to have a population that is productive, that is engaging, that is good quality of life, we need health. And that's why our emphasis being on healthy longevity and of course ageism, you know, issues of discrimination, issues of equity, all come up as an important determinant of health. So let me just say a word about what, in fact, is the grand challenge for those who are not familiar with this. The NAM recognized healthy longevity as its first grand challenge ever, first grand challenge, back about five years ago. And uh, we held an annual meeting, which the topic of aging was discussed extensively. I had one of the first president's forum, which we picked on this topic. And of course, we had a variety of people joining us from social scientists to engineer to biomedical scientists to in fact, uh, even the private sector and others. Those who are involved with finding new innovations to help uh, healthy longevity. And at the end of this, it became very clear that there is in fact a really important uh, need and to create a momentum around healthy aging. Hence, we launched the Grand Challenge. And there are two components to the Grand Challenge. One is what we call a roadmap. A roadmap, as you know, in the Canvas terms, is really a extensive consensus report that maps out where we need to be, our society, our nation, the world, in order to achieve health for everyone who ages. And that is a map that addresses social economic enablers, health and healthcare, and science and innovation. All told, the idea is to influence practice and policy. So this roadmap is an international commission 
co-chaired by Linda Freed of Colombia and John Wong of Singapore. And it's a truly international uh, commission of members from different parts of the world, uh, almost all continents, to discuss this global issue. And they are well on their way to now, in the last stages of putting together this report, which is extensive, that actually look at not only issues of science, issues of innovation, issues of healthcare, but importantly, social issues. We look at equity in a big way. And we all know that during COVID, it shines a light on this vulnerable population that in order to not to have a high mortality rate of the older population when achieving COVID, but in fact, they need to be healthier. We also look at the economic impact, both economics for the older population as well as economic for society, making a strong case for investment. So I think this is very exciting. The report will release early next year, probably in about February, no later than March. And we have a very extensive dissemination strategy to bring it to different parts of the world, engaging both policymakers as well as community workers to practice the issue of health longevity, working close with UN on decade of aging, and of course, many other organizations on this. The second part of the grand challenge is actually creating more innovation, what we call global competition. We've created a global competition that's unparalleled. We've been able to engage over 50 some countries and regions, um, actually sponsored by, funded by, eight and more funding agencies from China, Japan, Singapore, United Kingdom, European Union, United States, and so on and so forth. And recently we have the join of Chile and Canada and Hong Kong. So it's becoming really extensive. And our first round is just to say, let's give out $50,000 seed money. This was, by the way, the brainchild of the late Tachi Yamato, who I miss greatly. And he had brought it from the Gates Foundation experience of the Grand Challenge Exploration, giving us seed money for innovators just to start you know, exploring the idea. So we make the application very simple, a two-pager, no preliminary data necessary, no feasibility like the NIHOA, and we try to pick what's really bold and what's really game-changing. And we covered all the sciences from biomedical to engineering, digital sciences, social sciences, and everywhere, as long as we meet the goal of improving physical, mental health, well-being, quality of life of people as they age, not restricted only to over 65, because we all realize it's a whole life cycle of life cycle and health span. And so 1,500 applicants globally, we select 150. We have given one year of such support and we just had a global innovation summit. We announced the next set, but four of the first round winners got the next level of support called Accelerator Award of 750,000 to help them move it forward. And this is supported by j and J Innovation. We also have the opportunity to put forward five forward to European Investment Bank, which will give them also up to the same level, if not even more, to enable some of these ideas to move forward. The idea is to take you know, innovation towards application. And I think this will certainly would also create, in my opinion, a market for opportunities, but making sure that this is equitable access for everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna stop here just to say, I'm so enthusiastic about what you're doing. And today's topic is so relevant. I just wanna come by and say hello and answer any questions. Back to you, Walter and Judy. Thank you very much, Victor, for this uh, great introduction and for highlighting the importance of healthy longevity. So we're going to continue with the program. And um, we're going to invite uh, Nikita uh, Varman uh, from the NAM staff to give us an update on the activities of NAM and uh, aging. Nikita? I'm just going to share my screen. All right. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nikita Varman, and I'm a research associate with HMD's Board on Healthcare Services. Thank you so much for having me today. I will be providing you all with a brief update on HMD's recent and current projects that may be of particular interest to this group, especially as related to aging. But to begin, several prominent studies have been released this past year, a few of which are listed on the screen before you. In May, we put out two consensus studies, one that examines how to strengthen primary care services in the United States, especially for underserved populations, and to inform primary care systems around the world. And two, a study to extend the vision and chart a path for the nursing profession to advance the health and well being of the US population, reduce health disparities, and create a culture of health. In July, the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education, or abbreviated to DBAS, released a detailed study on the impact of dementia in the United States. This study focused on developing a research agenda for the next decade in the behavioral and social sciences as it relates to Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease-related dementias. It also assessed the role of the social and behavioral sciences in reducing the burden of dementia. And in April, three forums worked together to release the proceedings of a workshop held in January this year called Improving the Evidence Base for Treatment Decision-Making for Older Adults with Cancer. Sponsored by the Food and Drug Administration, this workshop series examined the root causes that limit enrollment of older adults in cancer clinical trials and strategies for improved inclusion of older adults across the drug development continuum. And now I want to draw your attention to some of our ongoing work at the academies. Victor went into great detail um, about the NAM Healthy Longevity Global Brand Challenge, again, a worldwide movement to improve the physical, mental, and social well-being for people as they age. Um, and to reiterate, the project is broken up into those two parts, the global competition, which provides awards, prizes to innovators, and the roadmap, which is a evidence-based report um, released by the committee. Um, the, in regards to the competition, the competition recently held their inaugural Global Innovator Summit and also made a number of new seed funding awards. A number of second level awards were also made and new countries and regions are coming onto board to join the competition in 2022. And the second ongoing project right now is, the second, is a consensus study that brings together 17 experts to address the quality of care in nursing homes. As the research associate on the study, I can tell you that we held a series of public webinars earlier this year and just held our fifth committee meeting. The project has an expected release date in early 2022. Now, of course, I have to give a shout out to Carrie Fulmer with the John A. Hartford Foundation and thank her for being our primary funder and the impetus for making this study happen. I also want to thank our other sponsors, the Commonwealth Fund, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, the Safari Foundation on Aging, and the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuel Foundation. Continuing the conversation of ongoing work, we also have two roundtables and forums of particular interest that have both been active over the past year. As you can see on the screen before you, the Forum on Aging, Disability, and Independence held a July webinar series on COVID-19 disaster preparedness and vulnerable populations in collaboration with the Forum on Medical and Public Health Preparedness for Disasters and Emergencies and the Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity. In August, the forum released an NAM Perspectives piece on protecting the medically vulnerable amid COVID-19. The roundtable on the right side of the screen has also held a number of workshops over the past year, including one on serious illness, structural racism, and health disparities during COVID, another on caring for people with serious illnesses at home during COVID, and a third on integrating serious illness into primary care. All of the roundtable and forum work I just mentioned are available and archived on our website. The Roundtable and Forum both also have a few upcoming events. From December 1st to 3rd, the Forum is hosting a collaborative workshop with the National Cancer Policy Forum on the role of companion animals, and on December 8th, a webinar on social isolation and loneliness at the end of life in COVID. In November, the Roundtable is hosting a webinar series on the impact of and response to the pandemic for people with serious illnesses. <laughs> And finally, we have two new and upcoming exciting projects I want to highlight quickly. We have an upcoming workshop on the mechanisms for organizational behavior change to address needs for people with dementia. This is a collaboration between HMD and the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education. 
And we also have an upcoming consensus study on transforming healthcare to adopt a whole health strategy. Thank you all so much again for having me and for allowing me to share a few highlights of our recent ongoing and upcoming work. Again, you can find all project information and archived presentations on our website. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikita. And uh, I hope that the members will take advantage of all the activities uh, that are being done uh, by NAM in this uh, particular area. So now we're gonna get started with the uh, first part of our discussion today, uh, of our program today. And I'd like to then ask uh, our moderator, Elisa Eppel, who is a member of the planning committee uh, to uh, take it from here. Elisa. Thank you so much, Walter. It's been a pleasure to be on the committee with you and Judy and Mary. And uh, this is a very exciting format where we're really uh, built in audience participation. So this is gonna be very interactive. Um, I'd first like to introduce our first speaker, Becca Levy. So Becca, welcome. Becca is an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Psychology at Yale University. Welcome. She, her research explores the psychosocial factors that influence older individuals' cognitive and physical functioning and their longevity. And it is with um, easy to say that she is the pioneer in creating the field that focuses on how positive and negative stereotypes can have, which are assimilated from culture, can have both beneficial and adverse effects on health and longevity. She has done the hard work of bringing this very robust field to dissemination, working with AARP. And she has also done the, um, I will say, brave but important step of disseminating this by writing a book for the public on this amazing body of research called Breaking the Code, How Age Beliefs Impact How Long and How Well You Live. So that should be coming out this spring. She's received many awards for her work, uh, too many to name, I'll just name one, the BALTS Distinguished Research Achievement Award from the APA. And she does tremendous service from to our field on top of all this, serving as a on the editorial board of journals and being the editor of the Handbook of Psychology and Aging and one of the um, founding editorial board members of Stigma and Health. Welcome, Becca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that very kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's a real honor and pleasure. Um, so I'll go ahead and I will share my screen. Okay, great. So thank you again for in inviting me to talk with you today on this very important topic of ageism in the area in the era of inclusion and diversity. So it's a very timely topic. So as you likely know, ageism is very widespread in our country today. So in a recent study conducted by the University of Michigan, 82% of older persons reported experiencing ageism in their everyday life. In another study, it was found that two thirds of workers reported witnessing or experiencing ageism. And yet, unfortunately, inclusion and diversity efforts fighting prejudice and, and stereotypes rarely include age or overcoming ageism. And there are some important exceptions, including the efforts of National Institute on Aging, which we're going to hear about later today. So just to give you two examples how, of how I think age has largely been excluded fr from um, inclusion and diversity efforts. In the workplace, we know from a recent AARP study conducted in 36 countries that most workplaces that have diversity and equity programs exclude age. And a social media example comes from um, a study that we did on how age stereotypes are portrayed on Facebook. And so we found looking at publicly accessible Facebook groups that focus on older persons that most include negative age stereotypes of older persons. 37% banned older persons from public activities such as shopping, and some even advocated killing older persons. And yet the Facebook community standards exclude age from the, the, the 10 groups that are protected from hate speech. And I should mention, it used to be that age was not included at all, but recently they added a phrase that said, age is protected if it is in conjunction with another group that, um, that, that is protected. 
So, so in other words, Facebook does not feel that age alone is worthy of protection from hate speech. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, ageism has been increasing. So there's many um, reports, both in the United States and in other countries. There was a Twitter analysis that found in the early days, there was 1.4 million um, sharing and liking of the term boomer remover, which mocks the idea of older people dying from COVID. There's also numerous examples of structural ageism during the pandemic. So for example, in the early days of the pandemic, we know that 40% of the deaths took place in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And one of the reasons for that was that there was not, uh, the government did not provide uh, personal protective um, equipment to the workers and the residents of these facilities. So what I'd like to do in my remaining time is argue that the stereotype embodiment framework can be useful to reduce ageism and improve older person's health. And what I'd like to do is briefly go over what that framework is, then I'd like to talk about the breadth and the depth of the impact of ageism on health. And lastly, I'd like to talk about ways that we could perhaps combat ageism and its impact on health. So starting with the framework. So when I started this research, this research that was being conducted on stereotypes, age stereotypes, focused on young people. So how they impacted the thoughts and behaviors of young people. And so I felt that it was important to include older people in this research and actually look at how the stereotypes may be impacting older, older persons themselves. So I developed a framework to think about what the process may be called stereotype embodiment theory framework. And it's the idea that age stereotypes are embodied when they're internalized from the culture that can lead to self-definitions that influence older person's health. And so this framework is a way to understand the growing number of studies and also make predictions and go forward with this research. Um, so there's four processes which this framework outlines by which these age stereotypes that exist in the culture can get under our skin or impact health. So the first process is that they become internalized across the lifespan. So we know from numerous uh, studies conducted with children that children as young as three have already taken in most of the age stereotypes of their culture. The second process is that they can operate unconsciously. So we know from our research that they can operate without people's awareness. And what's perhaps disturbing about that is it's hard to fight off these, the impact of negative stereotypes if we don't know the impact that they're having on us. The third is that they gain salience from self-relevance so that we have found in our research that they don't impact the health of younger people. It's not until people become older and identify with age older age that it starts to impact health. And lastly, there are multiple pathways by which these age stereotypes can impact our health. So the first is psychological. So for example, we have found that those people who've taken in more positive age stereotypes tend to have a higher will to live. Uh, the second pathway is behavioral. So for example, we have found that older persons who've taken in more positive age stereotypes tend to engage in preventive health behaviors. Um, such as exercising and eating a healthy diet. And the third is physiological. So we have found that those who've taken more positive age stereotypes tend to have lower stress biomarkers, uh, for example, cortisol. So now I'd like to talk about the breadth and depth of the impact of ageism on health. So we've conducted on uh, numerous studies that have looked at a range of outcomes. And in these studies, just to give you an overview, we have found that older persons who've taken in more negative age stereotypes tend to have worse cognitive outcomes, including memory performance uh, and dementia incidents. They have worse physical outcomes, including Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, such as plaques and tangles, uh, have reduced hearing performance, have elevated cardiovascular events, and have reduced physical function and recovery. Uh, we found that it can impact mental health outcomes, including higher stress levels and higher levels of psychiatric disorders. And we have found that it can lead to health behaviors. And uh, lastly, in numerous studies, we and others have found that each negative age stereotypes is associated with reduced longevity. 
And I'd like to give you three examples um, from our research that illustrate some of these findings. So I'll give you a cognitive example, a health behavior example, and a physiological example. So this is the first, this is our cognitive example. So in this study, we looked to see whether age stereotypes had an impact on dementia incidence. And this was conducted with about 5,000 participants in the health and retirement study. And they were all dementia free at baseline. And then we followed them over six years. And what we found was that the, um, and so the orange are those who started off with more negative age beliefs and the green bar are those who had started off with more positive age beliefs. And as you can see, looking at the two bars on the right, those who had positive age beliefs were significantly less likely to de develop dementia. And then what we also found looking at the two bars to the left, was that even among those who had the high risk ApoE4 gene, those who had a more positive age beliefs were also about half as likely to develop dementia over time. So that this I think suggests that we could consider age beliefs as potentially a preventive, um, positive age beliefs as a preventive area to uh, reduce dementia incidence. I also wanted to share with you a health behavior example. So this is from a recent study that we conducted we were interested in whether negative age stereotypes may contribute to the behavior of older persons rejecting COVID hospitalization. So this was based in part on the finding about excess deaths during the pandemic. So as you know, there were many deaths above and beyond those that were attributed to COVID that took place. So in 2020, there were 120,000 deaths in the United States that were above what would be expected based on previous death levels, um, but and they were not attributed to COVID. And so I was interested in the idea if perhaps they may be in part due to older persons avoiding hospitalization and dying without a diagnosis at home, in part because of negative age stereotypes, which can bring about a sense of uh, futility and also can elevate stress. So we conducted an internet survey of about 1500 older persons and we presented different scenarios. And one of them was what, what, would, what should, should an older person who is severely sick with COVID um, do? Should they be hospitalized to get treated? And what we found was as predicted, those who had more negative age stereotypes were significantly more likely to reject that the older person should get treated in a hospital. Uh, and this is a physical example that I'd like to share. This is from a study that, that looked at whether age stereotypes are associated with cardiovascular events over time. So this study um, in which uh, Dr. Frucci was a co-author and uh, he is, as you know, has been very involved in leading Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is what we used for this study. We um, So we looked at cardiovascular events, that's in our y-axis and then our um, x-axis, we're looking, it's the, years from baseline since they had a cardiovascular event. The blue line are those who started the study with more negative age stereotypes, and the red is those uh, is the group who started with more positive age stereotypes. And as you can see, those who had more negative age stereotypes were significantly likely to develop cardiovascular events. Something that's notable about this study is that we were able to include a group of younger adults, so as young as 18, who reported their age beliefs at the beginning of the study. And we found that e even in this group, the age stereotypes they reported at a young age predicted the likelihood of them having a cardiovascular event after they turned 60. So they're about twice as likely to develop a cardiovascular event if they had reported, um, had taken in more negative age stereotypes at baseline. And I think what this suggests is that if we design prevention efforts, it would be good to start at a young age. So young adults and probably even uh, children would be great to include in, in the efforts. Lastly, in talking about the breadth and depth of age stereotypes on health, I wanted to mention a study that I recently conducted with the health e economist. So uh, the reason that we conducted the study was I felt that we have been accumulating all these findings about how age stereotypes can impact health, but we have not yet seen a lot of change in policy in addressing the ageism. So I thought if we could come up with some financial uh, numbers that maybe that would actually be good evidence for policymakers to go forward and, and uh, actually make some change in policy. So what we found in this study is we looked at all older persons, uh, 60 and over in the United States over one year, and we looked at the eight most expensive health conditions. 
And what we found was that the impact of ageism, age stereotypes, um, negative self perceptions of aging on health was about $63 billion. And uh, this is just to give you some perspective is about is actually more than we now spend on um, morbid obesity in the same time period. So lastly, I would like to talk about combating the impact of ageism on health. So one key idea I think for thinking about combating ageism is that these age stereotypes are malleable. So we know from cross-cultural research that age stereotypes are very different in different countries. We know from our experimental research that we can shift age stereotypes. And we also know that age stereotypes change over time. So if we did a study examining age stereotypes over about 200 years, and we found that there has been a shift in age stereotypes, but unfortunately they're becoming more negative. But I think what the important piece of this is that we can change them. So that I think suggests that there is room for social change. So I think there's two directions that we could take to combat ageism. One is a bottom up approach to sort of actually give the skills to older persons to become more aware of the positive age stereotypes and to resist the negative age stereotypes. And the second is from a top down perspective from society to actually change and reduce the number of negative age stereotypes. But I think until we, uh, achieve that on a societal level, I think both levels are really important to work on. So to give you one example of a bottom-up approach, we conducted an intervention designed to bolster positive age stereotypes and improve physical function. Um, and what we did find in the intervention that we were able to bolster positive age stereotypes and improve physical function over an eight-week period. So this graph shows improvement in physical function on the y-axis. And then the purple are those who were in the group that was given the intervention that bolstered positive age stereotypes by exposing them to implicit positive messages about aging and also asking them to write an essay about a positive active older person. And we found that they did significantly better over time than those in the neutral condition. And something that was interesting about this study is we actually found that the effect grew over time. In terms of a top-down approach to ageism, uh, one thing that we could do is put in place an anti-ageism czar that could address structural ageism, and they could actually go to the source of the ageism. And so, for example, two places to start would be the anti-aging industry um, and social media. And the anti-aging industry in particular is a multi-billion dollar industry that profits from the negative age stereotypes. We could also promote positive images of aging and reduce negative images of aging in hiring, training, and everyday culture. We could also add age to all diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Um, and lastly, it would be great to launch a campaign that describes the health impact of negative age stereotypes based on the successful campaigns that have been conducted in the anti-smoking area. And lastly, I wanted to mention one campaign that just started this year. So the World Health Organization launched a campaign to combat ageism. There were 194 countries that have endorsed the campaign. Um, and I was honored that they included some of our research as their evidence base to go forward. And their goal is to combat ageism. So hopefully we will see some changes soon. <laughs> So uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention, uh, so these are some of the papers that I talked about in my presentation. And if anybody is interested in any of these, I'm more than happy to share any of our, our findings and studies. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge um, the funders of this research, including the general support of the National Institute on Aging and the collaborators uh, that include Dr. Luigi Ferrucci, who have made all of these studies possible. So thank you so much. There's never enough clapping and applause on Zoom, right? <laughs> it's always this awkward silence. Becca, that was absolutely amazing. And I, you know, the the way that you have grown this field in a short period is really mind-blowing. I mean, I heard you speak several years ago and already then I thought, wow, why aren't we doing more? This is so impressive. And you are, you're really implementing this. So I'm struck by your methods. You just use so much rigor and you use population-based methods, lab-based methods, clinical studies, and all of these studies, I don't know if anyone noticed, they were in the top quality psych or medical journals. 
and the policy implications are outstanding. So we'll we'll definitely talk more about that. The the strength of the case for health, healthcare, and economic burden. That's all, that last one showing the cost savings is always kind of the linchpin that researchers forget to do, and so we have less of a voice or impact. So that was a very important study. So the last time I saw you, we were both giving uh, talks in Singapore at an aging conference in the old days when we used to do that. <laughs> um, instead of just projecting ourselves virtually. Um, and we were so struck by the benevolent dictatorship and the public health safety net. And I believe that probably applied to the elderly. I'm sure your eagle eye noticed um, their policies. So you point out that policies and practices tend to be devoted to marginalized groups, but not the elderly. Why, why is that? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Lisa. So I think it's both factors that occur at an individual level and a structural level. So on an individual level, I think, especially in ageist cultures, there is a lot of resistance and fear and anxiety about getting older. And I think that reinforces the negative age stereotypes and reinforces the idea of distancing and not including older people in activities, including in the workplace. And I think on a structural level, unfortunately, there are a number of industries that uh, benefit directly from promoting the negative age stereotypes. So particularly the anti-aging industry, which includes you know, billions of dollars on wrinkle uh, solutions, wrinkle <laughs> creams, fighting aging, fighting, um, fighting aging as something that's a positive thing. And so I think that that in particular promotes through marketing and, and media, a lot of negative age stereotypes that lead to this exclusion of older people from different policies and practices. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, we'll get to talk more about that. I didn't want to steal the thunder from, we get to hear next from Luigi Ferrucci. Welcome Luigi, uh, who probably needs no, no, no introduction <laughs> in this crowd. He's a geriatrician and epidemiologist who's the director of the Baltimore Longitudinal Aging Study, the chief of Longitudinal Studies section at NIA. And he, since for almost the past 20 years, uh, Luigi has been <laughs> directing research at NIA and his has just done so much service. I just need to mention I my um, just respect and gratitude go out to people like you who are constantly curating and shepherding these longitudinal studies that we learn so much from that are so important. So Luigi has been uh, critical in many studies, the Enchanti study um, in Tuscany, Italy, the study of centenarians in Sardinia and the uh, and of course the balsa study. He's also just a, um, a scientific giant in terms of aging biology and has, has done so much for um, explaining pathways, major highways such as inflammation. aging. So Luigi, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Elisa, for the nice introduction and uh, thank you, Becca, for the fantastic talk. You know, you should know that I love working with you because you bring me back to, you know, the ground. You know, sometimes uh, we work on single molecule, a fraction of molecules, uh, and we get excited about mechanisms, but you always remind me that those little molecules, those little cells, and those organs live in an organism that has a life, uh, think in some way, interact with other people, is part of a society, and those elements are very, very important to understand what is happening in their body it can have strong effect on their bodies. And I, I, I don't know how to react really uh, at the same level of your very, very challenging presentation that certainly requires a lot of follow-up in terms of further science uh, that I hope we can do together. But, but uh, I wanna say that uh, the role of the older people had been fluctuating over history and you can follow this, uh, you know, in art, in painting, in music. The, for example, the class, some classical painting like this in Padua really look at the elderly as those teaching, uh, you know, the wise story about how to behave in life. And we know that this is only a small corner of how the elderly are treated and considered today. So what I'm gonna say is from the perspective of a gerontology and a geriatrician that uh, 
um, you know, the treatment of the elderly come in many, many different flavors. And, and you know, I referred you to back presentation, really, for the details. What I'm going to focus my reaction is, uh, you know, the fact that um, biological mechanisms are still studying young animals, with very good exception. I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that, uh, you know, our fight to promote inclusion of underrepresented minority is absolutely relevant for this discussion because uh, there's a double hit and there is data showing that, uh, you know, underrepresented minority who age uh, are also more disadvantaged than, the, you know, uh, non underrepresented minority that reach old age. And finally, I want to you know, this is a, a, an argument that has been discussed many times. I want to still say that in spite of many, many efforts, older people are still often excluded for participation in trial that are aimed at proving drug that in the end, they ask the real users. And so it really makes absolutely no sense to exclude them. So, so uh, one thing that, the, one example I want to give you is an old study that look at, uh, uh, the effect on minor, minor start on female mice. And, and this is an old study, but really strike me as an example of the past, hopefully, where they looked at uh, mice that were two, six, uh, and 10 months old, uh, and they pretend that by comparing them cross-section, they understand the effect of aging. I wanna show you, this is a very familiar slide on uh, the effect of metformin on, on, on survival. And you can see that this red line that I have here is at 360 days, which is, uh, you know, something around one year. And so even, uh, you know, if we look at the first years of age, instead of 10 months, uh, you can see that there are really not very much change in this curve of mortality. So aging has just started uh, barely. And so we need to learn much more in terms of uh, the uh, continuous of, of the lifespan. This is another example in which you know, the author look at uh, um, age-related change in behavior in these uh, uh, C57 VL mice. And then and, and they look at, as you can see, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the two, four, six, seven, and, and 12 months. And, and clearly, you know, they completely ignore, you know, the rest of what, what's happening. And of course, uh, you know, I have to tell that uh, NIA did, uh, really wonders to avoid this by providing old mice uh, to people that have grants uh, with NIA, but, but that's only part of the story. Because if we still keep thinking that the normal physiology occurred in young age, and there is not a physiology of the lifespan, we only look at a very little piece uh, of the puzzle. Uh, the, the story that I told you before about uh, you know, the double hit that the underrepresented minority uh, have during the lifespan, it was really prompted to me by reading this article in the Washington Post, where they, um, they, 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 they had 150 people screening uh, uh, about 100 resume each and then provide the judgment about hiring or not hiring. And you can see that, uh, you know, the difference between white and African-American is mostly strongly affected at a young age, but then resurface again, you know, the re-entering in the working force. And in this case, there were high level and sometimes scientifically related job appear to be really important. So I think that work that look at those two potentially synergic condition that lead to discrimination it will be extremely important in the future. This is another uh, study that had made people talk about uh, and uh, was part of BNAS and look at uh, the hazard of uh, employee uh, scientists actually that uh, exit uh, from the, um, you know, from, from the workforce. And you can see that, uh, you know, if you compare the 1993 and 2008, uh, there is really a dissociation where more and more 
uh, individual of old age uh, uh, decide to remain uh, as scientists in the working environment. For example, this is a, a typical event that occurred in NIH. And, and, and I have seen, in all honesty, some nasty and not agreeable discussion about this, because I think that uh, in all the cases I know, and, and probably in the majority of cases, this individual you know, the best and the brightest are those that uh, really carry the experience and can train the new generation of scientists. And, and of course, uh, it will be important that we maintain a very, very high standard, but making judgment about age is certainly not the solution to this problem. And, and uh, this is really reflected in also in the discussion that is occurring with the surgeon, whether the surgeon are too old to operate, uh, and um, I participated recently in one of these discussions where, you know, very, very brilliant surgeons uh, that uh, were still creating new techniques uh, uh, prompted uh, the idea that, yes, you need to be tested, the performance, manual dexterity, and, uh, you know, um, some intellectual function need to be uh, evaluated because we know that uh, those functions tend to decline with age, but there are many, many and, and, and the growing number of uh, people that even in very late life maintain absolute performance. Um, again, I wanna talk uh, about exclusion and I'm, I have two slides uh, that I wanna just show you very quickly. These are very, very, um, you know, recent drug, uh, Cancelor, is uh, it, it's a platelet uh, aggregation inhibitor, and and, uh, and 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 then there are a number of other drugs that are mostly anticoagulants that are used mostly in older people uh, in atrial fibrillation or in the prevention of um, the venal thrombosis. And, and you can see that, uh, uh, you know, this black line represents uh, the identity between the population, the composition of the population of users uh, and those that are include, included in clinical trials. And you can see that uh, in many, many cases, the over 65 and especially the over 75 are absolutely underrepresented in this trial. And this is really happening in the last few years. So in spite of greater attention to this problem, this is still happening. This is a paper that was aptly published by Marie Bernard. Um, uh, excuse me, Marie, but I had to redraw this picture because I wanted to make the case that uh, all the clinical trial by trade that are recorded uh, at, in, at, at NIA, at, at the, NIA, at the pub, yeah, clinical trial .gov between 1965 and 2015, you know, the number of exclusion of those 75 years old is still very, very high. And, you know, for drug, for conditions that are very, very frequent in the elderly, such as dyrrhythmia, coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, uh, and congestive obstructive pulmonary disease. So um, in the BMJ in 2001, say that we need to launch you know, a, something to reduce the discrimination of the elderly, especially in the context of healthcare. And I think that we need to reinforce this message and um, understand, as Becca saying, that uh, this is as much as a problem of physiology and as a problem of society that uh, need to turn, you know, uh, aging in, into a positive uh, aspect of our life and take a life course perspective where every age of life has its value um, if we develop a culture that, uh, that really appreciate that. Thank you, Becca. And as I said, it's always a pleasure working with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Luigi. Stay with us and we'll invite Becca back. We already have some great questions and I'm already just you know, my mind is racing with this dialogue and the, the level what we're at. We can talk about mechanisms and specifics, but I think we're also, we have time to get to some of these big issues and we have wonderful people joining us here like Richard Hodes and other leaders in aging. It's always exciting to have a NAM meeting um, to have such a distinguished group in the audience. We did have a hand raised from Ron DePinho, so I'll call on you first. Hi, everybody. Uh... 
It's good to be here. Those are fantastic talks. So I just wanted to add a sort of mechanistic element to the first talk in particular. Um, and this is well known, but uh, just I'm really struck with the curve of uh, showing that uh, this notion that when you have these early entrenched perspectives, that that has an impact on cardiovascular disease later in life. I mean, it, it almost looks like hypertension. Uh, and so that begs the question as to whether or not, if we really understand the mechanisms driving that, uh, are there therapeutic opportunities for us to, you know, uh, diminish or, or bend the arc of that, of that trajectory? And uh, of course, I'm sure this group knows very well the work in telomeres. Uh, Richard and I actually did a lot of work on, on telomere mechanisms and so on over the years. Uh, we generated the knockout mouse and studied it and so on. And uh, many uh, contributors have shown that chronic unrelenting stress instigates uh, telomere damage and uh, damaged telomeres uh, can have very significant effects on virtually all hallmarks of aging. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether or not in those studies, whether it would be possible to ascertain uh, telomere status as a surrogate, almost a you know cholesterol level, um, uh, you know, or C-reactive protein level uh, biomarker that can help us identify those that you know might, coupled with um, the right sort of questionnaires, etc., uh, whether or not that might be able for us to identify this high at-risk population. Uh, for which therapeutic intervention might be more beneficial. Thank you. Yeah, that's a gr great idea. I think that, that that's a, a wonderful area to go forward and think about the role. And you know, I'll, I know Alyssa is doing a lot of work on this as well. And yes, I, I think that that would be a great area to look at as both a mechanism, but also potentially identifying people that are at higher risk that we may want to target. Okay, I just have to add quickly. Um, thank you so much, Ron, for this comment. I think that uh, telomeres have stood the test of time in meta-analyses for predicting degenerative disease and certain types of cancer. And, met, um, and I think the, there's been a little um, you know, question about the measurement, and I will say a big question. There is a telomere research network funded by NIA and NIEHS, that has really put forward some gold standard measurements so we can use the PCR, which is so important to our population, larger population-based studies with more reliability. And I think that will help. We are doing studies looking at prediction of antib COVID antibody response, looking at telomere length in the different cell types. Uh, for example, using Peters Lansdorf method, Maria Blasco's, the PCR, the Southern Blot. So we're really comparing a lot of methods, as well as TIFFs, the breaks in telomeres. And of course, your work has been um, uh, absolutely fundamental to putting this area more on the map with cancer, et cetera. Thank you for your comments. If just a quick thought on that, because uh, I, I do recognize that it's really challenging just to look at telomeres. But uh, you know, we had shown that when you have telomere dysfunction, it has a major impact on the pathway that is important for mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as for uh, uh, regulation of uh, oxidative defense. Mm -hmm. And so I would argue that uh, telomeres are very important, but if they're, if they're complemented with um, measurements of, of, uh, of telomere of a uh, mitochondrial mass or function, uh, or, or looking at oxidative damage or even the expression of oxidative defense genes, that together the, I think that would really enhance, make more robust mm -hmm. that biomarker, which yeah. is really this connection between genotoxic stress, mitochondrial function, and oxidative damage. If you do those three, I would bet that you'd have a very robust uh, biomarker that yes. when complemented with the stuff that Becca does, yes. you know, Liz in terms Blackburn of just said the exact same thing to me that uh, we uh, need to measure the tripart. We need to think of it as a network and, and we're yeah. going to have strong, a stronger pattern in results. So we have a hand raised from David Allison. Welcome, David. Thank you. Um, 
terrific presentation. Uh, I have a question very closely related to the one Ron DePino just raised, and then a sort of extension of it. So the question is, given that it's unlikely that we all want to study the longevity of an organism that lives as long as we do, namely humans, um, we do need the biomarkers. So what does it take to make us convincing that we have either a single or a composite biomarker that we can hang our hats on and say, yes, in a randomized controlled trial in humans, I observed a change in this in a few years. Therefore, I can say I've really slowed senescence. That's part one. Then part two is if you believe that senescent cell burden is part of that, to what extent do you think microchimerism, uh, particularly, you know, as we have a, a model for it in fetal maternal microchimerism, is a potential buffer against or moderator of the deleterious effects of senescent cells? That's to Luigi. So, so I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I will let, uh, you know, um, Becca certainly address the first question. But I think that what has been discussed now is a perfect research agenda for me to work with Becca for the next grant. Because uh, as you all know, you know, most of what the BLSA is doing now is to develop, uh, you know, phenotypic and biological biomarkers of the pace of aging. And so that is a big challenge. We can't really in any way demonstrate any intervention that is reducing the pace of aging if we will not be able to measure you know, the, the rate of aging. And so I think there are some of them that are very promising, certainly telomeres is one of them, and uh, there are investigators and in IA that are working strongly on that. I think that uh, the epigenetic clock is certainly one that um, we want to work a lot more because I think that the latest development are really promising. I think certainly the senescence is one that is important. The problem with senescence is that um, it's very difficult to measure in because it's really it will have to be measured in tissue. So our approach has been that we measure in tissue in a limited number of individual. And then we see whether by doing proteomic in plasma, we can capture a signature of senescence. If we can, then we can use that signature from a blood sample to really understand. Your question about microchimerism is really interesting, but I don't know enough really to give you a sensitive answer, honestly. Thank you, Luigi. Um, we have about 10 more minutes. I am uh, inviting people to use chat because otherwise we have this kind of rigid sequential dialogue, right? That Zoom limits us to. And there's so many um, great ideas and uh, inputs, perspectives from our audience. So please feel free to respond to David or Luigi here. I'd like to uh, ask a question back to Becca, your intervention for age-related beliefs. And we've got two related questions. Sharon Inoue asks, can you tell us a little bit more on what you did to combat ageism at the individual level? And Consuela Wilkins wants to know, have you looked at this data by socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity? Yes, thank you. So yeah, thank you for those great questions. So in our intervention that we conducted, which was a field study, so we went out to people's homes and brought with us laptops. And um, what we did was we once a week for four weeks, exposed people implicitly to positive age stereotype messages. So unlike some of our lab studies, which in which we randomly assigned people to either a positive or a negative age stereotype condition, we felt when we did the field study that we didn't want to expose them to negative age stereotypes. We felt like that would be unethical. So in this study, we actually just compared them to positive age stereotypes and the neutral condition. And the neutral condition, we presented kind of random words on a laptop. In the positive age stereotype condition, we presented positive age stereotypes on a computer screen at speeds that allow for perception uh, without awareness. So we were pre presenting different positive images, but we also had an explicit piece of it in which we asked people to write an essay about a positive, active, older person. And so we did find that that made a difference by repetitively exposing people to these positive messages in different ways, which I think does have implications for ways that we could go forward on, on a larger scale. Um, in terms of looking at different 
groups um, by socioeconomic status and race ethnicity. So in, in our field study, which we just completed, uh, it, we, don't, we didn't have enough people to actually stratify. So that's a direction that we're going forward to be able to stratify, but we did adjust for different factors. So we know that above and beyond socioeconomic differences that, um, that we still, we see the effects in all the groups that we have looked at. And in, in, in our bigger longitudinal studies, we are able to, to pull apart by stratified groups. And we find, we have found in every, just about every group that we could think of, we found the effects of these positive age stereotypes leading to uh, beneficial health outcomes. We have a question about, um, well, I'd like to hear both your top down and kind of healthcare provider ideas for intervention. So you mentioned we could do a campaign. And when we do these public health campaigns, they, they take about 10 years to actually see, you know, see change in the data. And I'm just wondering, is that is that really the right way to intervene? You have these nice potent individual effects. Uh, you probably have ideas about targeting healthcare providers. This was a question by Carmen Garcia Pena from Mexico. How do we target the medical systems bias? Um, and is, are there any shortcuts here? Do we have to do the billboards and that kind of really small effect over time? Yeah, I mean, so I think that there are a lot of different ways that we can promote positive age stereotypes and reduce ageism. And so I think some of them will take, so I think the World Health Organization campaign, I think they're actually saying that it was a 20 year uh, campaign that before they think that there'll really be world changes. But I do think there are small changes that can happen much more quickly. And so for example, even just adding age to all these diversity and equity programs that are already in existence that people are already being exposed to in the workplace, it wouldn't take a lot of work for age to be added and to raise awareness in a really important structural way. So I, yeah, I think there are definitely some short term but very potent changes that we can make to overcome structural ageism. Luigi, did you have a comment? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the problem is that uh, the healthcare system really has lost contact with the consumers. We used to have the doctors that uh, were not only providing uh, prescription of drugs, but also maintaining the contact and have some educational you know, aspect, uh, in, especially in the smaller town. And, and we don't have that anymore. We rely on uh, you know, access to the emergency room that are crowded and provide you know, absolutely no human you know, aspect uh, of, of what the people need. And I think that uh, finding way that uh, our healthcare system provide this intervention that uh, will eventually improve health. And so they need to come from there. I think that that's something we need to think of. Knowing that changing behavior is the most difficult thing that we do. And so I think that 10 years, so I wish we could do it in 10 years because it's kind of an optimistic, but uh, not an impossible time frame. So um, I'm going to, well, I was about to turn it over back to Walter. We're gonna move on to our next one. We just got a question, important question from Sharon anyway. So I will end with that. Um, Sharon, do you wanna ask it live? Sure. Thank you so much. So um, hi, <laughs> Becca, Luigi, Alyssa. Um, I have been involved in a lot of um, inclusion efforts um, nationally, internationally, and I've been finding encountering repeatedly a lot of resistance to including ageism with our other DEI criteria, even at the NIH, <laughs> Dr. Hodes, <laughs> Richard, um, you know, the, the argument I keep getting is, well, it falls under intersectionality, right? The older minoritized populations are the most at risk. And so, but I think that's a very limited focus. I think ageism as, as you've shown, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, is you know, a huge factor. 
And I'm wondering if we can um, find a way to get ageism represented um, in these other initiatives and how to do that. Because I really do feel it's a very yes. difficult issue. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for your very pointed um, comment. It looks like Richard has a response. Well, I, my, my response is to, is to point at Marie, who's answered uh, in the chat uh, and can speak to the way in which NIH has very broadly appreciated the importance of a lifespan perspective, including inclusion in research and beyond. M Marie, uh, in addition to your chat, Arthur, do you want to mention something further? I would just like to say that the data that Luigi shared were uh, data that helped us to develop uh, policy at NIH on inclusion across lifespan. It went into effect as of January 2019. And when the second inclusion across lifespan workshop was held uh, September 2020, um, the Center for Scientific Review was able to say that we had gotten far away from the issue of arbitrary exclusion of older adults based on an age limit, at least. Uh, only 2.5% of applications at that point, and that's more than a year ago now, uh, seem to be non-compliant. Uh, and of course, they're not acceptable when they're not non-compliant because of the new policy. Um, the other challenge, of course, excluding people based upon multiple chronic illnesses is a big one. And that's something where uh, there's going to need to be further evaluation and possibly further enhancement of the policy. Yeah, and just to, just to emphasize what Maria said, I think we all want to be careful uh, not to be overly regulatory or intrusive as a federal agency. But if you want an example of a way in which making requirements a criterion for funding and carrying out research that can have an effect, not in 20 years or 10 years, but in a shorter time frame, this, this is one of those examples. Wonderful. Well, I, it's great to end on that positive note to hear about real changes that are being made. Thank you so much, Becca for your really lifelong body of work that is really being um, spread to other uh, research groups and, and young students and areas. And this was a fantastic conversation. Luigi, thank you so much for being a such a, a relevant and powerful discussant today. All right, back to Walter. Thank you very much, Elisa, and uh, to all the speakers and the participants in this part, uh, first part of the program. We're now going to move on to the second part of the program, and I'm going to ask uh, the Vice Chair of the Planning Committee, Judy uh, Salerno, to take it from here. Judy? Thank you, Walter. And those last questions were a great segue to our conversation, which will now shift to looking at a focus on diversity of the, the research workforce with particular implications for um, aging research. And um, I realize that it's a, it's a lot to sit through two hours. So if you wanna put yourself on um, non-video and stand up and do some jumping jacks, go ahead. Um, I know it's, uh, it's tough if your home office is anything like mine to, to sit for long periods of time. So uh, feel free to move around off camera. Um, so now it's my great pleasure to welcome our next speaker who is another person who does not need an introduction. Uh, Dr. Marie Bernard has, was the deputy director of NIA for the past 12 years um, and uh, a colleague of mine for many, many decades. Um, in October of 2020, um, she took on a new uh, position at the NIH as Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. And um, following the, the founding director of, um, of the, um, that group. And um, she's played a key leadership role throughout her time at the NIH. Um, and, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's a founding member of the Diversity Working Group and NIH Equity Committee and co-chair of, as you heard, the NIH Inclusion Governance Committee, which oversees inclusion and in clinical research by sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and age. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Bernard 
today and to ask her to talk to us um, about uh, the scientific workforce and what the, the future holds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. It's, it was really an honor to become the Deputy Director at NIA in 2008 following you. Um, and it's been an honor to be given this opportunity to move on to become the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. So I'm going to very quickly give you a 50,000 foot view of why this is important. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm gonna start first with a case example, and then I'm going to pivot to talking to NIH's value of scientific workforce diversity and very specifically the NIH Unite initiative. So the case of aducanumab, I know you're all very familiar that it was approved by the FDA through an accelerated approval pathway. I know that gadanabarab, I probably mispronounced that, was just approved. I don't have the data relative to it, but aducanumab really caught at least my attention and that of many others because it was the first FDA approved drug that uh, was based on its effectiveness in reducing amyloid plaques, as we know. Amyloid plaques, tau tangles develop the amyloid years to decades before symptoms. Uh, and theoretically, something like this uh, that would uh, get rid of or slow the process would help with the illness. The trials were limited to people who were diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or early stage Alzheimer's as would be appropriate given what we know of the pathology of the disease. Uh, and uh, initially it was approved very broadly and that was revised. So there was the labeling criteria consistent with the uh, trial criteria. However, um, it's a challenge when you're thinking about the extrapolation of these indications, uh, the trial data to underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Um, these are groups that uh, more often uh, have a missed or delayed diagnosis. Uh, missing diagnoses are common, quite honestly, uh, across the spectrum. Uh, for uh, uh, non-Hispanic whites, some 41% of people seem to have delayed diagnosis, but for African-Americans, and Blacks, it's 46%, Hispanics, Latinos, it's 54%. So there are implications to this. Uh, additionally, the drug was listed at $56,000 per year. Uh, and there are additional costs of IV infusions at a specialized center, PET scans or CSF testing to detect amyloid, MRIs at baseline and periodically thereafter to monitor for side effects. So this raises questions about how accessible this will really be for groups that are underrepresented um, in the general population. Uh, and just looking at the data with regards to income, this, has, this drug has ampl implications across the board because the highest median income is among Asian populations, followed by whites, followed by Hispanics, followed by blacks, but you know, $56,000 a year is a lot. So third party payers will have to pick this up for people to generally uh, have access to it. Even more concerning, however, is the phase three trials that were the basis of the approval of Biogen's proposal. 89% of participants were white, 9% were Asian, which means very few were from underrepresented groups that have the highest prevalence of the illness, African-Americans and Blacks, Hispanics. Um, and this, I would posit, is representative of the challenge of not having sufficient diversity among the scientific workforce that would be developing the trials and thinking about the drug among the workforce that would be going out and recruiting uh, subjects to be involved in the study. Uh, we know that uh, for drug development, it's really important. Uh, we know that Black, African-American, Hispanic, and Native American physicians are more likely than white physicians to practice in underserved communities where there can be the outreach to those populations. And we know that those populations, when they have a choice, would prefer a health professional who represents their own racial or ethnic background. Uh, we also know from the NIH perspective that we need everyone to help us to solve the big challenges in biomedical science. It's like trying to describe an elephant without having sight and having people who come from lots of different perspectives, personal experience, professional experience, helps us to make better science. Um, this is demonstrated by uh, burgeoning literature, um, a wonderful study by Freeman and Wong that looked at some 
2.5 million published uh, journal articles to look at the frequency of which they were cited and the impact factor. And they developed what they called the homophily index. The more homogeneous the author group appeared to be based upon last names um, and guess at ethnicity, the higher the homophily index, the lower the impact factor, all the way out to a very low homophily index and a high impact factor. Of course, you'll look at that and say, Marie, that's 10 authors, it's different types of science, uh, I agree. Um, but when you look at things like geographic diversity, information diversity based upon who they're quoting, all of these things point to diversity making a difference. Uh, and there are other studies that uh, speak to this as well. We also know that there is burgeoning talent. The most recent census data, again, reinforces this, that we are not necessarily fully uh, taking advantage of. When you look at who gets an R01 grant equivalent from NIH versus who's in the uh, STEM workforce versus the general population, it looks like we have really good representation among non-Hispanic whites. Um, one could argue that super representation among the Asian population, but there's a lot of lost opportunity among the Hispanic and Latino population, among the Black and African American population, and uh, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders are so small that they wouldn't even register on this, and they're not shown in this slide. We know as well that when you go through the professoriate, that you, when you start off at the instructor level, you have underrepresented women, well-represented women, underrepresented men, well-represented men in much greater proportions than you see when you get to the professor level and the department chair level. Uh, again, arguing to the fact that we're missing out on talent when we're trying to tackle some of the big problems of biomedicine. So what are we doing? Well, NIH has developed this position of the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, as was uh, noted. Uh, it was, I'm the second Coswood. I was honored to be asked by Francis Collins to step in as the acting Coswood last October. Um, I was the Coswood and deputy at NIA. Um, at the end of May, I was uh, officially made the permanent Coswood and stepped away from many of the duties that uh, uh, Judy was uh, talking about that I'd held and you know, fully focusing on this role. I also co-chair this NIH Unite initiative. So what is NIH Unite? It's an initiative that got started last year, right after um, the videotape murder of George Floyd, as we were very cognizant of the high morbidity and mortality among communities of color. Uh, it brought really stark relief, to, or put into stark relief, uh, the ongoing reality of racial injustice in our country. So there were a series of intense institute and center director meetings starting in June of 2020. There were uh, a self-assembled self group who came forward, in particular a group called ACRE, Eight Concepts of Racial Equity, a group of relatively early career scientists who brought forward objective data, uh, case studies to Francis Collins and Larry Tabak, and then to all of the NIH leadership demonstrating that the issues of racial injustice were not just outside of NIH's gates, they were within NIH as well. Uh, and it led to a shared commitment that we must address structural racism that we're at a tipping point, we couldn't let the moment pass. So in February, we unveiled this initiative, five interacting uh, work streams, one to understand stakeholder experiences, another to develop new research on health disparities, minority health and health equity, one to look internally and to address our own culture um, so that we could role model what it is that we're gonna be asking of the external community. Another to hold us to be transparent, to communicate and to be accountable for what we're doing. And a last one that would be, that's looking externally at what needs to be done at the ecosystem, with the ecosystem. We said on February 26th when this was, this was unveiled that this is a marathon, maybe even an ultra marathon, but the mile markers along the way would be report outs to the twice yearly advisory committee to the director meeting. So June 11th, when we reported out, um, this is what we said. We said in February that we publicly commit to identifying and correcting any NIH policies or practices that may have helped to perpetuate, help to perpetuate structural racism. And to that end, Francis Collins on Friday, February 26th, made this statement. On Monday, March 1st, it was published on the website, um, the NIH uh, Unite website. 
where he apologizes to individuals in the biomedical research enterprise who've endured disadvantages due to structural racism. And he's gotten lots of positive feedback from advisory committee members and others for taking that stance. We said that we would continue to aggressively implement approaches to address the Ginter gap to enhance portfolio analysis. What's the Ginter gap? It's the science 2011 uh, publication led by Donna Ginter, Reynard Kington and others that showed that there was a persistent disadvantage for African-American and black scientists in receipt of R01 equivalent grants, uh, even when you controlled for all sorts of factors. Initially it was seen for multiple uh, underrepresented racial ethnic groups, but it was persistent with African, African-Americans and blacks. And we know that we are on a slow uh, trajectory to that being corrected, but we intend to accelerate it. Uh, these are data from 2013 and 2020. We have a 2018 data point that shows it is um, uh, a trend of increased applications for African-Americans and Blacks. Um, such small numbers for American Indians and Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders that you can't even see them. Small numbers relative to their numbers in the general populations of Hispanics, Latinos. So, you know, but improvement and improvement in success rates as well, although the gap persists and the numbers are very small. So we're, we're working in total to address these things. We said we would launch a multi-phase tiered and integrated common fund initiative focused on transformative health disparities research. And to that end, it was published amazingly to me just a month later um, as a common fund solicitation. And just this week, the awards were announced um, with uh, six awards going uh, just in general for that, five for um, uh, interventions focused at minority serving institutions and there will be an additional competition for the second RFA in fiscal year 22. We also said that we were going to ensure a robust NIH-wide commitment to a then in development NIMHD RFA on structural racism and discrimination and its impact on health. And sure enough, that was published less than a month later with 25 institutes and centers supporting it. And my understanding is that there was a very robust response to the solicitation that closed August 24th. A bonus, the NIH-wide Brain Initiative put forward a funding opportunity announcement that for the first time uh, includes a plan to enhance diverse perspectives as a consideration for scoring. Uh, we're all very excited about this. We're looking forward to seeing whether it has the impact in helping to diversify the scientific workforce that's anticipated. Um, certainly, uh, there's several other FOEs that have already used that language and several that are in development that will use the language. And we said that we would develop a sustainable process to systematically gather and make public the demographics of our internal and external workforce. Um, paying attention to the issue of transparency or the concept that sunshine is the best disinfectant. To that end, we now have posted on our website uh, uh, in the OER data book, data by race, ethnicity, and disability status for funded investigators, as well as uh, career stage and gender. And it's data like these that leave me feeling pretty confident that when you think about the study of aducanumab sponsored by Biogen, although it's not our study, that there probably was not a lot of diversity among the scientists who were involved in putting the uh, project forward and developing the outreach. Uh, we also have our own internal data uh, published by race, ethnicity, and by job categorization. So we also pledged on June 11th that we were going to do a number of things between that date and the next advisory committee meeting in December. So I'll tell you what those are and give you some updates on some of them. One of them was to uh, thank President Biden for putting for, for forward a proposal for more, more funding for the Minority Health Institute, Nursing Institute, Heart, Lung and Blood, and Fogarty International Center. Those are institutes that have disproportionate numbers of African-American, Black, and other underrepresented scientists applying to them, but they have lower than average R01 success rates. Uh, we're currently in a continuing resolution. We'll see what happens for fiscal year 22. We're encouraging uh, institutes and centers to develop their own uh, disease-specific and topic-specific areas related to health disparities research. And I can tell you that I know there's a lot of activity along those lines. And we will probably be seen, you'll probably be seeing a number of those uh, solicitations released in the near future. 
We said that we would develop programs to spur institutional culture change in support of inclusivity and equity. And I'll give you an update on one of those. Uh, it's something called the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program. This was actually released in December of 2020, but it was built in the spirit of UNITE. There was a lot of work being done internally, as I said, before UNITE was um, uh, externally unveiled. The intent of this program is to create cultures of inclusive excellence at multiple academic and research institutions across the country. It's modeled after what has proven to be a successful program within NIH called the Distinguished Scholars Program. So it calls for faculty cohort uh, model of, of hiring, multi-level mentoring, integrated institution-wide systems to address bias, faculty equity, mentoring and work-life issues, and the funding of a coordinating center uh, to evaluate all. Uh, the, fund, the funds come from the what's called the Common Fund at NIH. Um, some um, $240 million are committed over the next nine years. And these are the first cohorts that have been funded. And I will publicly say thank you, Richard Hodes, for being among the IC, uh, ICs that helped to extend the pay line for this. Um, so you see here some high resource institutions, some low resource institutions, the Tuskegee UAB uh, application is a collaboration. Um, we're very excited about this. And there'll be two more rounds. There'll be one in fiscal year 22. Those applications have already been received and one for fiscal year 23. Uh, Morehouse School of Medicine is the coordinating center for this. We also said that we would increase uh, career opportunities for underrepresented groups, starting with the Science Education Partnership Award that targets K through 12 STEM education. And so that Solicitation of IC sign up is ongoing. Uh, we said that we will examine staff interactions with with applicants to make sure that there's not there is no bias or in, any equal treatment that might impact a scientist's likelihood of pursuing funding opportunities. Um, that we would expand our interactions with and our support of historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions. So that in a whirlwind fashion is where we are with regards to UNITE. Um, and I always like to close with this quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, because we've heard from many that they don't necessarily see themselves here. Uh, what about um, intersectionality? What about people who don't recognize themselves as having come from a racial ethnic minority? Uh, but as Dr. King has said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And our viewpoint is that as we step back and look systematically at everything that we do at NIH, policies, procedures, practices, um, our goal is for us to have a fair and equitable environment and it will benefit everyone. We have summarized this in a, um, a commentary in Cell that was published June 10th. Um, there will be a commentary in Nature Medicine coming up in uh, November that uh, is launching a diversity series that they are starting um, that gives a little bit uh, more uh, advanced discussion of what's going on with UNITE and other diversity initiatives at NIH. And these are the 80 plus people who make this move forward. These are all volunteers. Um, the only people who are actually paid for doing this are uh, Marge Esther, who's a program support person, and Victoria Rucker, who's the program manager. I'm very honored to co-lead this with Larry Tabak and Alfred Johnson, and very excited about the possibilities that are going to come from this and our other diversity initiatives. I think it's gonna translate into much better science when we're thinking about um, the uh, studies of older adults. Uh, and I'll just close with our favorite adage, uh, great minds think differently. Thank you so much, Marie. That was a great overview. And thank you for your leadership and for the leadership of NIH for, um, for taking these very public and rapid steps to address structural racism in biomedical research since NIH influences the landscape so much. So this is really um, wonderful. And uh, I'm very struck by the public acknowledgement of, of uh, what has happened, transpired at the agency. 
um, because you can't fix what you don't recognize. So I, I think it's really a giant step forward. And um, we look forward to discussing this more in our um, Q&A session. Um, right now, I would like to introduce uh, another leader, um, Dr. Consuela Wilkins, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and Vice President for Health Equity at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She's the principal investigator on three NIH-funded centers, the Vanderbilt Miami, uh, Miami, yes, Miami Meharry uh, Center of Excellence in Precision Medicine and Population Health, focusing on decreasing disparities among African-American and Latinos using precision medicine the Vanderbilt Recruitment Innovation Center to enhance recruitment and retention in clinical trials, a huge problem, as we all know, and the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. So she's pioneered many, many methods of stakeholder engagement that involve community members and patients in all stages of biomedical and health research. We uh, look forward to your comments, Dr. Wilkins. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share um, any stage with uh, Maria Bernard. Um, I'll just quickly um, add that my titles have changed, I think, Judy, since the, the um, bio you received. Um, I am a professor of medicine and um, just in July, I'm now senior vice president. Um, so uh, probably taking on too many roles there, but uh, want, wanted to share that. Um, I think it's really amazing the work um, that uh, has been done in this area focused on, on um, diversity in the scientific workforce. And also as a card carrying geriatrician, uh, I'm especially delighted that Marie is, is in a role uh, helping to lead this. I do have a few slides that I prepared to, um, to share a little bit about my response uh, to this. And um, I, my, my key points um, that I really wanna make are, I think it's important that we distinguish between diversity, uh, which we are often talking about in the setting of, of equity and inclusion and health equity. So this impact on aging research, um, you know, we, we are um, conflating sometimes these terms. And I think that makes it sometimes challenging for us to understand which policies need to be adjusted and why. Um, and I also want to say that as we think about the diversity from the standpoint of demographic diversity needed to impact aging research, we also need to think about the diversity of disciplines needed to, um, to really change aging research. Uh, and then the last point I wanna make is about you know, resisting the idea that concordance in um, you know, scientific workforce with a population of people um, is the answer and that we can't use that as sort of this um, opportunity to, for, for each of us to uh, sort of advocate our own responsibility for understanding these underlying structures um, that have marginalized and oppressed people uh, and have led to many of the inequities that we have talked about today. So when I think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and I think most of the time we are also talking about um, the, the race, ethnicity, gender, um, background, culture, um, language of the individuals in the scientific workforce. Uh, and I think that's obviously very important, not just from the standpoint of, again, um, you know, we need people who look like others, uh, but if we're, if we're really prioritizing excellence, um, then you know, we have to acknowledge that diversity equals excellence, all of the data, some of which Marie has already shared, uh, that, that focus on you know, more innovation, better outcomes, higher um, publications and higher impact journals, all of these scientific outputs as well um, that are associated with diversity of, of teams. Uh, but, but that is different than health equity. So when we talk about health equity, we're talking about everyone having a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. And some of what we've talked about today, um, including Becca's presentation about ageism, really I think falls in this health equity space 
of, you know, are we providing fair and just opportunities for people to be healthy? And that is different from the diversity of the workforce. So although there certainly may be some overlap and people, you know, who have lived experiences um, that have been from, from marginalized and oppressed groups uh, may be less likely to have, uh, you know, portray any of, of the ageism, but that's certainly you know, a broad statement and not necessarily at the, at the individual level. Uh, but what we need for um, everyone, including older adults, to, to have these fair and just opportunities to be healthy, uh, again, requires a different way of thinking about you know, um, who's at the table, who's developing and implementing the science. Uh, and I think from uh, for a long time, we have continued to reject our role as scientists um, in uh, perpetuating and maintaining these systems of racism and inequities. Uh, and uh, we have a long way to go for from, from the standpoint of, of, of scientists uh, before we can really even uh, begin to think about how we move forward towards equity, health equity, if we don't recognize these systems, these structures that are really uh, requiring and limiting how we, we actually um, discover and uh, can implement scientific uh, findings. I think an important example in these two graphs I'm going to show are actually created by the American Medical Association. They've done an amazing job in the last uh, a couple of years with this focus on racial justice. Um, so if, if you can follow this certainly very busy map, uh, a graph here, uh, and just look at what is not a surprise to most, if not everyone, will already be familiar with, you know, the Japanese internment camps that uh, were, um, were put in place at, from a policy just after um, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, that you know, over a hundred thousand Japanese Americans went into these uh, these prisons in 1941, and more than half of them um, were children. These children are older adults now. So to to imagine that we're talking about caring for populations of people who had very different experiences growing up in the United States and not recognizing the history um, and, the down, and the downward consequences uh, means that we're not, not really fully capturing all of the information needed to understand health among these populations. Uh, similarly, um, Black African-Americans in this country um, were marginalized and oppressed for many years. Uh, and if you were a, a sick, a, 16, 18 year old graduating from um, you know, high school in 1966. This is at you know, the time of the 1965, the time of the Civil Rights Act. Depending on where you lived in the country, you had a very different experience. You might have lived in um, the rural Mississippi Delta, which is where I'm from, and had to split your school year um, because you had to stop and ch chop cotton and pick cotton uh, like my mother did. So not being able to understand these social circumstances and how people actually, uh, and how that impacted their lives. And you know, what are the environmental changes? Do we understand um, the DNA methylation that uh, has occurred because of that? Are we capturing that in our research? Probably not. And, and I and some colleagues have written about this in addition to the inclusion of individuals uh, from these diver diverse backgrounds in our research, we need to have the, uh, the data uh, from all these different uh, perspectives um, that include social determinants of health to fully understand um, disease and be able to um, create, develop interventions um, to uh, increase lifespan, to understand again, health and well being. And so we, we can't just think about more people from these backgrounds, we won't be able to actually understand um, uh, disparities if we're just focused on increasing the number. And I think this speaks to overall how we, um, how we need to consider uh, the kinds of research we do. We can't make excuses for uh, not having a sample size that is um, large enough to understand 
understand disparities. I think, you know, uh, Marie, Marie's uh, bringing up aducanumab uh, is, is really unconscionable in my mind that a disease, Alzheimer's, uh, that is up to two times more likely to impact uh, Black and Hispanic uh, Americans um, to, to not only not even have a minimum number, you know, uh, of people from these backgrounds in the study, uh, but certainly not representing the, the burden of the disease in the country and the world. Uh, and we, we cannot tolerate or accept um, as scientists, as funders, as editors, publishers, um, that science is being produced without um, acceptable numbers of individuals from these marginalized and minoritized backgrounds. This is bad science and we should be rejecting it wholeheartedly. And I think I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much. This has been a very rich conversation and um, I would like to start off, we don't have much time for questions, but I'd like to start off by asking both Marie and Consuela, um, you both brought up the issue of high prevalence in um, certain underrepresented groups, but low participation in clinical trials. So um, how do we in aging research approach this in a way where we're not, um, where, where we're focusing on both isms, racism and ageism? Thoughts? I would like to start, and I know Consuelo could uh, elaborate uh, very generously, but that was the whole reason that there was an inclusion across lifespan workshop too in September of 2020, uh, because we were hearing loud and clear uh, particularly from the aging research community that um, it's a great policy, but there'll be people out there, in fact, the majority of people out there who are doing clinical research who aren't familiar with this and they need some tools. So I would really encourage people to take a look at that uh, workshop summary and some of the tools that were pointed to there. Uh, but it's not just simply, you know, you check the box and make things happen. Uh, as as Consuelo has, has said, there's a lot more to it. So I'll toss the ball to you now, Consuelo. Thank you. Well, I, I, I would always start with, uh, you know, the issue of trust. Uh, and um, we, we often talk about trust in a way that is putting the blame for lack of trust on people who are not participating. Uh, and I think we should flip that and ask if we are trustworthy enough. Um, and to be trustworthy means that we are, again, designing research with the participant, potential participant in mind. So that's from the standpoint of age and race, ethnicity, culture, background. You know, is the study designed so that it is decreasing the burden on the potential participants? Is it accessible to them? Uh, you know, all of the issues that we've had with you know trying to make sure that the the language is you know culturally right, but also is it at the you know are the words big enough or you know is it you know at a time where people and place where people want to and can get to. Yeah, I, I think we have to substantially change how we um, how we think about the participant journey if we're going to be inclusive of people <laughs> based on age, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. We've got to reject um, that we know how to do this because we've done it poorly, uh, and and I think we need to bring in those voices of people, including potential participants as well as social scientists, onto the team, not just as you know, folks to help recruit, but to help really think about the study differently. I think that's a great point. And, um, you know, we, we have not done a good job about giving voice to people who have not been heard uh, around research and, and um, the burden of disease. So thank you. We have a question um, from a couple questions from a question from George Hill. Uh, what may be some reasons why there's a higher incidence of Alzheimer's in black and brown population? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say that, you know, there, there certainly is data that uh, cardiovascular uh, risks are um, associated with Alzheimer's disease and, and as most of you know, are in higher incidence prevalence among uh, groups that have been minoritized and uh, marginalized. I, I will say that, um, you know, interestingly, again, as it relates to aducanumab, which for those of you who are not familiar really is, is focused on um, 
amyloid, uh, which is one of the you know proteins, the key proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm involved in a study now that is looking at amyloid PET imaging. And um, the preliminary data that we have from, from that study actually shows that even though African-Americans and Hispanics uh, and Latinx elders have higher prevalence of, of Alzheimer's disease, um, they actually had um, less positivity, uh, amyloid positivity um, in, in, these pet, in this PET imaging. So if we're, you know, again, creating um, drugs that are focused on uh, amyloid and in these uh, populations that have a greater burden, we may find that there's more vascular, uh, coexisting vascular disease, uh, then, then we now have a drug that won't even work in this population or may work differently, I should say. Thanks. Marie, would you like to comment on that as well? Since you no, I, I just would say um, I fully support what uh, Consuelo pointed out there. There are also some studies that suggest that the genetic manifestations of uh, uh, or the genetic uh, changes that are associated with Alzheimer's in various populations will vary. Yes, race is a social construct, but you know, there are some slight variations there and that may be associated with differences in manifestation, uh, again, related to vascular disease rather than uh, just pure amyloid accumulation. So we need to have those populations representatively included. And I'm really excited about the uh, announcement that the New England Journal has recently made about expecting that when there's gonna be a clinical study uh, published, that there's gonna be data about who you know, how the disease manifests itself, uh, what are the populations in which it's manifest, as well as the data with regards to the study that uh, is being proposed, because I think that's going to help people to really see whether or not uh, there's been attention to the appropriate population. Thank you. There are a couple comments in the chat about um, what we need to do to enhance uh, DEI work within our institutions. One is that we need to pay for it. And um, I wholly support that as we, we uh, pay for the time our, my staff and our organization spend on DEI work and uh, not overburden people of color and women with service where we always seem to wind up. Um, so I think that's, uh, and, and Sharon makes the point that that cuts across all areas in STEM and academia. So as uh, two women, um, women of color, would, would you like to comment on that? I would certainly say yes. Um, this should be a value. It should be at the top of the consciousness of leadership of organizations. Um, that's the reason that Francis Collins statement is so very meaningful. Uh, the fact that all the Institute and Center directors have bought into this and, and amplified it uh, is really meaningful. Um, there has to be, you can pay for services. I mean, there, there's this tendency to want to bring in outside consultants to make this work happen. And that's one thing that we do need to be cautious about. Uh, we don't want people to feel like, okay, I've paid for the service. Okay, I don't have to worry about it any longer. It needs to be something that is part of the core values of the organization uh, and that everyone uh, feels that they have a role in. Uh, but I agree fully that many times the burden for me, making, move, making things move forward falls on women and people from underrepresented groups. So in, in July, I, I took a, on a role or expanded my role and now oversee the Office of Diversity at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So before I was in the health equity space and I would say that's where my career and you know, my, my work has been up until then, you're really focused on the outcomes and people and the, res and the research related to that. And I actually um, intentionally stayed away from diversity. Um, I, I almost you know, rejected any role you know, outright of being involved with diversity because the work is undervalued, um, it's um, non-incentivized in many ways, and it's also very hard. So you know the the burden of trying to change a system that has now decided that you're the person or the people that are responsible for changing it, um, and not really recognizing how the structures and policies in place are 
are um, continuing to perpetuate these, you know, um, lack of diversity. And I would say the lack of inclusion or specifically the exclusion. So, you know, we, we often talk about how, you know, you know this person is the first uh, woman, this person is the first African-American, this person is the first Asian in this role. Um, and, and we don't take a step back to say, you know, what were the policies, practices, and culture that created this exclusion in the first place? And so, you know, being in these roles where you, you now have all of this responsibility and um, to, to change the system that is really resistant to change, whether people recognize it or not. Uh, and, then, and then you have to absorb often, you know, this culture that is is toxic and um, again, devaluing the work uh, and triggering sometimes for you um, and, um, and still trying to find a, made to, a way to make it work. And so I think you know, there has to be increased recognition to really the incredible burden that people um, uh, bear uh, and, and there need to be incentives associated with it, including on the promotion and tenure track. Like if you really want people to change it, it can't just be about effort or dollars or you know removing something else. Like where does that fit in the overall institutions and the academy broadly? Uh, the the academy's you know goals, the the principles and and guidance of, of who we are um, that that has to have value. Thank you so much. We're out of time, and this has been a wonderful conversation. And on a very critical issue. And I hope that this is the beginning and that we can um, look in our interest group to doing more in this area. I'd like to turn it back over to Walter now. Thank you both. Thank you very much, uh, Judy and Marie and Consuelo for great uh, presentations and a great discussion. So this will be the end of the uh, open session, the public session. Uh, we're gonna close that um, right now at 105.